the fun. Um, let's pray. God, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the sufficiency of it. We thank you that we can go to your word and uh, just uh, know and assume that your word is right. And when everything else seems to uh, contradict it, when our thoughts, our, our ideas, the, the human wisdom, when everything may contradict it, we just know that your word is true and it is right. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the confidence, the anchor that is your word. And so this morning as we dig into it, I pray that we would just understand what it is that you have for us. That we would, by the power of your spirit, make application um, of it to our lives. That you would change us and that we would be more equipped to be used by you to bring others to you and to bring glory to your name. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we looked at uh, point number one, which is every Christian is a what? A disciple. Every Christian. If you are a Christ follower here this morning, and uh, Scott uh, referenced the definition I gave you last week, a Christian is not the definition that we might find in our world today. I think 60% of Americans today still call themselves Christians. The percentage of those in America that are actual Christ followers is nowhere near 60%. I hope that you understand that. Um, a Christian is some of all people who by faith alone, in Christ alone, have accepted God's gift of forgiveness. And who through repentance have confessed Jesus Christ as Lord. Now, that's taken straight from various passages of Scripture that uh, we are introduced to the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So all people, regardless of where they live or their age... Um, who have by faith alone, uh, through Christ alone, accepted the gift of forgiveness and through repentance confessed Jesus Christ as Lord. Um, and all Christians, this is not some add-on, this is not some bonus that a uh, certain group of people um, uh, choose to do and, and others who are Christians do not. All Christians, the Bible teaches, are disciples. We use the word Christian. The word that Jesus used for those that followed Him, for those who responded to Him, was disciple. They're synonymous. The words, the terms, the concepts, they are synonymous. And so if you know Christ this morning, uh, you are disciple. And a disciple is anyone who, or, or a disciple is somebody who is under the tutelage, under the teaching of a teacher in order that they would then be able to <coughs> imitate their teacher. That's the goal of being a disciple. Um, a New Testament scholar, William Kind, says, A disciple is one who responds to the call of Jesus in faith, resulting in a relationship of absolute allegiance and supreme loyalty through which Jesus shares his own life and the disciple embarks on a lifetime of learning to become like his master. Does that describe you this morning? If you know Christ this morning, if you say, yeah, I'm a Christian, does that describe uh, your heart and your desire this morning that you have embarked you, uh, through faith, you've come to know Jesus, and it has resulted in a relationship of absolute allegiance and supreme loyalty through which Jesus shares his own life and the disciple embarks on a lifetime of learning to become like his master. That's what it means to be a Christ follower. It's, it doesn't make us a Christ follower. It doesn't make us saved. Um, it is a result of being saved. It is a result of God uh, forming in us, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. And part of being that new creation is walking in that newness of life and imitating uh, Jesus Christ. And so here's what we get to this morning, uh, point number two. So every Christian is a disciple. Here's point number two. You know, this is not, uh, well, depending on your uh, perspective, this is not necessarily good news. Um, but it's the news that we need to hear. It's not news that we very often hear. Discipleship, point number two, is costly. It is costly to be a disciple. There is no easy road to becoming like Jesus Christ. Now understand this. The work that God wants to do in us is empowered by His grace. Okay, there is no way that any of us on our best day could ever become even remotely more like Jesus Christ on our own. It is all by the power. It is grace that saved us. It is grace that keeps us. And it is grace that moves us into deeper relationship and likeness to Christ. But it doesn't remove from us personal responsibility. Paul told Timothy to train himself 
for godliness. To work toward it with the work that God empowered him to do. Paul speaks of his own life. He says, I beat my body, 1 Corinthians 9 says, and I bring it under subjection. Lest by any means, after I've preached to others, I myself should be uh, disqualified. Uh, Paul often uses terms that remind us of the, um, uh, the work. Again, the God-empowered work. Don't ever get past that or miss that. But God has called us to uh, this uh, effort that is empowered by grace. And discipleship is costly. Yeah, Mike? Sorry to interrupt. I think your battery's dying. Oh, okay. Mm, I don't I, he's got it here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, that goes. Okay, much better. Thank you. Uh, discipleship is costly. I, I, I was thinking last night as I was just re re reviewing uh, my notes, uh, there are times in which I wish that I could join the ranks of the many uh, feel-good preachers that just tickle people's ears. That just present the uh, following of Christ as... Um, in fact, you have heard the phrases. Uh, come to Jesus Christ. He just wants to give you a wonderful life. Uh, come to Jesus Christ. He's got a wonderful plan for your life. Now, again, depending on your perspective, that, that's actually true. Uh, eternity with heaven is a wonderful plan that God has for us. Eternity with Jesus Christ. But the bottom line is, the truth is, um, discipleship is costly. If you know Christ here this morning, and it is your desire, and you are uh, uh, being very intentional about becoming like Christ, it will cost you something. Uh, not just because of the fact that we live in a world that is very anti-Christ, but because we as people, before we knew Christ, were very anti-Christ and very, very unlike Christ. And so the process of becoming like Him can at times become very painful. It can be challenging. It can be difficult as God with His hammer and chisel begins to chip away at um, the life that we have come to know and to make it into the life that He wants it uh, to be. Discipleship uh, is costly. I wrote down uh, a few things that I, I think the Scriptures are very clear that will uh, change or need to change as we begin to form into the image of Jesus Christ. Since you came to know Christ, um, have you noticed a difference in the people that you hang around? I was thinking yesterday as Steve spoke at the men's breakfast. He said when he came to know Christ, uh, he didn't dump any of his friends. But as God began to change him, his friends began to dump him. His friends began to be less interested in Steve because Steve was looking a little bit more like Christ as the days went on and his friends just were no longer interested. Um, as we grow in the image of Christ, uh, we're going to lose some of the relationships that we had before we knew Christ. Because... Um, we begin to look like something that those who don't know Christ are not necessarily that interested in. In Psalm 119, David even says this. He said, God, uh, he's speaking to God in a prayer. Psalm 119, he says, I will um, uh, surround myself with those who love your law. That was uh, where David found himself because he loved God's law. Have you noticed as you uh, came to know or, or as you've grown in your walk with Christ that um, it has cost you anything in regards to your time? Uh, the way that you spend your time? Uh, we're in uh, Sunday morning. It's Deerfield Bible Church. If you know Christ, you're a part of the body of Christ. And that means that God has called you to, to, to be a discipler because disciples disciple. And so, as I grow in my walk with Christ, and God changes me, and God changes you, God has called us to be involved in each other's lives. He's called us to be part of the big C church that we talked about last week. But He's also called us to be part of this particular body of believers here in Deerfield. And that's going to cost us time. 
That's going to cost us um, the time that it takes to be involved in each other's lives, to be a sharpening influence in each other's lives, to be a discipler in the lives of those around us, to be part of functioning as the body part that God has made us to be. It costs us our time. We need to rearrange things um, as we grow in our faith and uh, function as a disciple. How about your family? As you've come to know Christ and grown in Him, has it affected your relationships with family, particularly those who don't know Christ? I was thinking last night about Kristen, um, who is an exchange student at Jesse Remington, and she went home this week to China. Uh, Kristen came to know Christ uh, during her time year here at Jesse Remington. She's the only person in her family who knows Jesus Christ. And she shared with me that uh, going home to China is a little bit scary. <coughs> Because her Christianity guaranteed this summer is going to cost her something. Particularly in a place like China, where there is no tolerance for Christianity, for other people's beliefs. And uh, her family will not respond, likely, positively to this decision that she has made. How has um, your walk with Christ affected your relationship with family I put down a fourth thing because I think this tends to be the most obvious as we grow in our walk with Christ. How has it cost us our behaviors? Did you know as we grow in Christ that our behavior will change? It's one of the most obvious things that starts to be observed. Daniel chapter 1 says that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. Because of Daniel's heart and desire for God, there were certain things that he could not, would not do that uh, he determined that God had determined for him that would defile himself. There were certain things that he couldn't eat, certain things he couldn't drink. And for you and I, there are certain places that we really just can't go. There are certain things we can't view with our, with our eyes. There are things that we can't laugh at and, 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 and listen to. Because if we're living uh, to answer and then apply what would Jesus do, we're going to increasingly hate what Jesus hates and increasingly love what Jesus loves. And our behavior is just going to change. And listen, it's not necessarily, in fact, uh, my experience has been that it's not so much that um, it's against my will. It's not that we wake up one morning and say, ah, I want to do that so badly. But I just can't. Although there will be times when that takes place. As God begins to change the heart, God begins to change the want to. God begins to change the desires. Uh, some time ago, I had somebody mocking me because of the standards that we have for television viewing. The things we don't watch and the things we do. And sadly, this was one who professed to know Christ. He said, you ought to just be able to watch anything you want. And I really didn't know how to respond at the time, but I thought about it later and I thought, you know what, you're right. I do watch everything I want. I just don't want to watch that garbage. I don't find anything entertaining at all about watching sexual perversion or anything that is promoted on the television that is contrary. I don't enjoy it because God's changed my want to. And as we grow in our faith, um, that's what God desires to do. And it costs us something. It costs the way that we used to live. Did you know that 10 of, the, of, of, of 12 of the early apostles actually lost their lives for Jesus Christ? Gave their lives for Him? Paul writes in Corinthians, he said he was stoned, he was hungry, he was naked, he was imprisoned, he was beaten. All because he was a disciple of Jesus Christ. Discipleship is costly. I think a great question is then why do we do it? Why do we embark on this? Uh, why, uh, why not just pretty it up and, 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 and throw away all this cost stuff and pretend that it's not the case like so many others do? I think Paul answered that question in Philippians chapter 3. He says, Indeed, I count everything as loss compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Discipleship is costly. But it's worth it, is what Paul is saying. Discipleship is costly, but when he stacks it up next to the worth of knowing Christ Jesus as his Lord, of that intimacy that forms in him with Jesus Christ, with the God of heaven, Paul says it is worth every bit 
of the cost that uh, he experienced to know Christ. He says, for his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. As we grow in Him, God's desire for us is that the things that we once found as a treasure, the things that we once held dearly to, that those things would, uh, we would remove our grasp from those and we would understand that compared to knowing Christ, they are nothing more than a heap of rubbish. He says He wants to be found in Him, not having a righteousness, not righteousness of His own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. And then he wraps that section up with this, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and may share in His sufferings, becoming like Him even unto His death. Plus, I want to become like Jesus. I want to become like Him even to the point of death, if that's what it takes. James McDonald said years ago, he said, you see the problem in America is that we've made it so easy to be called a Christian without becoming Christ-like. We've redefined what it means to become a Christian, but you see, we didn't define it in the first place, so we really can't redefine it. To become a Christian is to become a Christ follower. To become a Christian is to adopt a new lifestyle that says, what would Jesus do? What would He not do? And that is what I will do and what I will not do by the grace of God. Diedrich Bonhoeffer was a uh, pastor during Hitler's regime. And he was an outspoken pastor while most pastors were uh, pretending like nothing was happening and being silent about what Hitler was doing. Diedrich Bonhoeffer uh, spoke up. He opposed um, Hitler and his, uh, his rule and uh, gathered many around him in the process of doing so. And uh, as a result, was hung for his resistance. But Diedrich Bonhoeffer, before he was killed for that, wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. And in that book, Diedrich Bonhoeffer wrote about um, what we now know as cheap grace. He termed this, this thing called cheap grace. And then he went on to define it in the book. He said, cheap grace is preaching forgiveness without requiring repentance. Cheap grace, he says, is baptism without any kind of church discipline. Cheap grace is communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. I would suggest to you that more often than not, what is preached in America is cheap grace. It is grace without all of these other things. He goes on to say, costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again, the gift which must be asked for, the door at which a man must knock. He says it's costly because it costs a man his life. And it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. Grace to follow Christ, to disciple, to be a disciple, will cost us our lives. I heard somebody say years ago to somebody else, they said, man, I'd give everything to have the walk with Christ that you have. And the person responded, well, I'm glad to hear that because that's what it's going to take. You need to give everything. Dietrich Bonhoeffer made famous this phrase, come and die. That's what it means to come to Christ. To come and die. To die to everything that we once were and held to and held on to. I think the problem in the church today, which is a big problem, begins with the way in which that we, the way in which we have presented uh, the gospel, or the uh, supposed gospel. Have you ever noticed how different preachers today uh, present the gospel uh, than uh, the G than Jesus did? You ever notice how different today, if you hear somebody giving a, a quote gospel presentation, how unlike the way in which Jesus presented it, it is. You ever notice that? In fact, in Hebrews, or Luke chapter 9, which is on the board here, Luke 9 uh, verse 57, as they were going down the road, someone said to him, that is Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. 
So here's a person. They're excited. That is probably, you'd think, just the words that Jesus wanted to hear from somebody. Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. It's at that point that a preacher here in America steps in and says, well, let me take you through a few steps, and then I will give you this assurance that you're on your way to heaven if you followed those few steps. Jesus, on the other hand, says, uh, well, foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. What is Jesus saying to this guy? Listen, you can follow me. I welcome that. But understand this. The foxes have holes that they can live in. And the birds have nests that they can live in. But this guy that you're saying you're willing to follow, there are times that I don't have a place to lay my head at night. And if you're going to be one of my disciples, there will be times in which you also will not have a place to lay your head. Are you willing to count that cost? Do you really want to follow me? Understanding that. The passage goes on. Uh, he says to someone else, follow me. But this person says, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. So here's a person uh, Jesus calls to follow. And the person seems to have some sort of interest. They say, I, I want to, I want to follow you, but, but I'd really like to delay it a little bit because uh, my dad is back at home and, and, and he's still alive. I'd really love to live out the rest of his days and when my dad passes, then I'll be free uh, to follow you. And Jesus says to him, uh, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. Those are hard words. Those are strong words. There's no encouragement from here, uh, from Jesus here. There's no bait and switch. Listen, let's just dumb it down and come to me and then I'll reveal to you the real cost of this. Jesus just lays it all out. If you put your hand to the plow and, and there is any hesitation at all and you look back, then you're not fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus wants, Jesus requires from you and I our complete and utter allegiance. He will not share the throne with anyone or anything. And listen again, I have to stress this. This isn't something you and I muster up. Salvation is God's thing. And He calls people to salvation. And He gives them the gift of repentance. And He gives them the gift of faith. And, faith, and by grace, He saves them. But you see, what has happened is we have dumbed down this message and we've made it a message that's not biblical at all and twisted it and turned it and left out things and added things. And so people respond to it because they'd be stupid not to because who doesn't want to avoid hell and go to heaven? Jesus, no, it's more than that. There's a cost to it. Yes, it is grace. And yes, you will spend eternity with me in heaven. But from the moment you say yes, I'm going to begin to chip away. And I'm going to begin to break you and make you into the image of Jesus Christ. Jesus does not mince words or pretend. He doesn't also accommodate people's preferences. I see that happening a lot today. I see people saying, listen, I would never, for example, believe in a God who would do what the books of Joshua and Judges say He did. He told His people to go in and kill men and women and children and to completely uh, annihilate these, these people groups. I would never believe in a God like that. You know what the church is doing today? Okay, well then let's see how we can rewrite Joshua and Judges. Let, 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 let's, let's just throw those books out altogether in order to accommodate your preferences. I've heard other people say, I never believe in a God um, if I've got to believe that evolution is not real and not true. I would never believe in a God that supposedly spoke the world into existence and so the church has accommodated that. Well, let's just um, throw out the book of Genesis and there's no end to it. There's no end to accommodating of people's preferences. If we're not going to believe in the God of the Bible, then we just can't believe. If we're not going to come to God at His terms, then we simply cannot come to God. It's His way or it is the highway. In Matthew 16, verse 24, Jesus told His disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Or this translation says, If anyone wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. Where was Jesus going when He took up His cross? To Calvary. He was going to His death. 
Jesus says, listen, if you want to follow me, there is a death to self that has to take place. There is a death to the old life that has to take place. He says, if you're going to follow me, there is a denying of self and a taking up of the cross. Romans 12, we we had it on the board, do not be conformed to this world. God calls us in that passage to be a living sacrifice. A sacrifice is dead, right? But we're called to be a living sacrifice. It's costly, it's painful. He's called us to take up our cross. I came across a, um, an advertisement for the Pony Express. And some of you uh, recall hearing this before. Uh, when the Pony Express began, uh, they knew that it was going to be a dangerous task for these young men to be traveling across the country delivering mail. And they didn't want any babies. They didn't want any crybabies. They didn't want anybody chickening out halfway through. And so they just said, we're just going to lay it out on the line and let people know, here's the cost of it. And so this was the wanted poster for the Pony Express. Young, skinny, wiry fellows, not over 18, must be expert riders, willing to risk death daily, orphans preferred. That was the advertisement for the Pony Express. What was obviously the purpose? So that nobody got there. It was really hard. It's really cold out there. There's bandits out there. I don't think I want to do this anymore. If you signed up for the Pony Express, you were willing to die. And that's the same thing that Jesus is doing here in Matthew and in Luke. And 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 all four of the Gospels record these accounts. He's calling people to a death to self. So that we don't get halfway into it and say, you know what, I don't think I'm interested anymore. I don't think this has any real interest in me. It wasn't what I anticipated. Whoever, verse 25, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. A lot of people want to just hang on to their life. A lot of people just, here's the problem, we place our trust in the things of this world. We place our trust in whatever it might be, money, fame, uh, popularity, pleasure. And we think that somehow those things will be the things that will give us hope and life and, and will deliver for us. Jesus says, if that's, those are things we're going to hang on to, if we're going to hang on to our life, we're going to lose it. We're going to spend an eternity in hell apart from God. But he says, those who are willing to give up their life will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Right back to Philippians chapter 3. Nothing is worth, nothing can compare to the worth of knowing Christ Jesus as our Lord. Nothing can compare with it. Jesus had a conversation with the man that we had on the board, the rich young ruler. Remember the conversation? He comes to Jesus and he says, "Um, a good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What does Jesus respond to him? Not a response that we ever hear this in here in our Western culture. In fact, I heard a, a, a quote gospel presentation just this week that didn't even remotely resemble the gospel presentation in the Bible. And sadly, many responded to that. And the preacher said, if you just responded to that, you're on your way to heaven. No. No. If you don't give the gospel and somebody responds to something that's not the gospel, you can't tell them that they're on their way to heaven. It, it's sad because I've met so many who have thought that they were saved and were not because somebody sold them a bill of goods. The rich young ruler says to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says to him, listen, you're rich. Sell everything that you have and take the money from the proceeds and give it to the poor. And then you'll have eternal life. It's a confusing passage because it sounds like Jesus is saying to this guy, listen, you want eternal life, you've got to earn it. That's not at all what Jesus is saying. You see, Jesus had the benefit of knowing the heart of this man. And Jesus knew that this man's allegiance was to his money. Jesus knew that there was no way that this man was ever going to have Jesus on the throne of his heart and and have just Jesus on the throne of his heart. He was always going to have to share that with this man's wealth. And when Jesus says, go take everything you have and sell it and give the money to the poor, what he was saying is, listen, are you willing to make me first and priority in your life? Because if you're not... You cannot have eternal life. And the Bible says that that man walked away sad because he was not willing. In fact, the Bible says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to be saved because of that confidence and that hope that is placed in their wealth. In Luke 14, 
Just in case you think that they're just kind of picking portions out of Scripture, it's all over the place. Luke 14, great crowds accompanied him, that is Jesus, and turned and said to them, and Jesus said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. We don't want to hate. Of course, Jesus doesn't want us to hate. We interpret Scripture with Scripture and we're to love God with all our hearts. Saying, listen, if you do not love me more than those to the point in which somebody could discern, but you hate them compared to your love for God. He says, you cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And then he breaks it down and just really nails it on the head. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Listen, if you and I were going to go build a tower, we'd, we'd take on paper and a pen and we'd start writing down the materials. And, and here's what the materials will be and here's what it's going to cost. And then we take out a schedule. Here's how long I think it's going to take. And so here's how, how much I'm going to have to pay the laborers. And here's how much I'm going to have to pay the skilled guys. And, and, and before we ever started the tower, we want to make sure that we had enough funds to complete it. And he goes on to say, otherwise, when he's laid a foundation, he's not able to finish. And all who see it mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. For our sake and for God's sake, God doesn't want people starting on a path that they're not going to finish. You know how many people I've met and spoken to that say, listen, I tried Jesus and he did not deliver. And so I walked away. Not only does that give disillusionment to the person, but it's a terrible testimony for Jesus as they share that, as they live that testimony in the presence of their children or their spouses. Jesus, I tried Jesus. He didn't deliver. You know what 1 Peter says? 1 Peter says those who put their trust in Christ will never be let down. They'll never be ashamed. There's no such thing as uh, we give our hearts and surrender our lives to Jesus Christ and He doesn't deliver. There's no such thing as that. I had an occasion to introduce somebody to, or not introduce, but reintroduce somebody to Jesus. And they said that very thing. I tried Jesus 20 years ago. I tried Jesus. And he didn't deliver. He's never changed me. And I brought him to First Peter. And his name was Al. And I said, Al, listen, 20 years ago, either you lied or God lied. Either God saved you and didn't change you, which is a lie. And he doesn't do that. Or you just went through some phony set of man-made guidelines and never really got saved. And you're expecting God to change you and you're not even one of His children. You're not even born again. Two days later, he showed back up on the job with tears in his eyes and said, I am born again for the first time in my life. But 20 years of disillusionment, 20 years of thinking God did not do what He said that He would do. He goes on in verse 31, What king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not first sit down and deliberate whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? If not, while the other is a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. He said, you want to be my disciple? Jesus says, count the cost. Count the cost before... You become a disciple. Kyle Eidelman says the biggest threat to the church today is fans who, fans who call themselves Christians but aren't actually interested in following Christ. They want to be close enough to Jesus to get all the benefits, but not so close that it requires anything from them. Here's how Paul put it in Ephesians 4. This I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Listen, our minds aren't futile. We know Christ. We've got the Word of God. We've got the very words of life at our disposal and the Holy Spirit to impart those words to us. Paul says those who don't know Christ, their minds are darkened. There's a futility in their thinking. That's why they live the way that they do. He says you ought not to live like them. They're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them due to the hardness of their hearts. They become callous. They've given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about Him and were taught in Him as the truth is in Jesus. That's a big assumption. 
Because I rarely meet anybody today who learned about Jesus from a biblical perspective. Who has presented the gospel in a biblical way. Paul says, to put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. He goes on in the next chapter to say, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. And in 1 Peter 1 we read from God, be holy as I am holy. That is the standard, that is the measure. Kyle Edelman again says, fans don't mind him doing a little touch-up work, but Jesus wants complete renovation. Fans come to Jesus thinking tune-up, but Jesus is thinking complete overhaul. Fans think a little makeup is fine, but Jesus is thinking make over. Fans think a little decorating is required, but Jesus wants a complete remodel. Fans want Jesus to inspire them, but Jesus wants to interfere with their lives. That's what it means to be a disciple. That's what it means to follow Christ. That God will come in and we surrender to that work of Him going into every nook and cranny of our lives and changing us. Changing us into the image of Jesus Christ. I have three questions. Questions I just want to close with here that I think it's important that every single one of us ask. Number one, in what ways has my life changed since I met Jesus? In what ways can you personally identify that your life has changed since you met Jesus? David Platt is a preacher and he uses this illustration. He comes in to preach and uh, he was uh, um, said to them, he says, now imagine, and he just looked normal. He was dressed nicely and uh, he just looked uh, um, ready to preach. And he said, imagine if I came in here and I was a half an hour late. And he said, I got up here and I said, I want to apologize for being late. <laughs> But here's what happened. On my way here, I was walking down the road and I got hit by a Mack truck. I just got blasted by this Mack truck and that's why I'm a half an hour late. And you looked at David Platt and he looked, um, uh, as again, not disheveled. There were no cuts or scrapes or bruises. He said, what would you think? And he says, of course, that you would think that, well, David Platt is lying. There's no evidence at all that he got hit by a Mack truck. Listen, Jesus is that Mack truck. When Jesus saves us, Philippians 1.6 says we can be confident in this very thing, that he who began a good work in us will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He's going to change us. There's going to be evidence of change. He's going to begin to form us into his image. And people who don't know Christ don't look like Jesus. And so the contrast for those who do know Christ will be great. So in what ways has my life changed since I met Jesus? Here's number two. What have I lost as a result of coming to Jesus? In what ways has discipleship for me been costly? I think it's an important question to ask because if we look at our lives and say, you know what, really not. Then we need to ask question number three. What is God calling me to that I've not submitted to? What is the work that God wants to do in my life that I've been kicking and screaming uh, against? I love this little, you remember the um, footprints in the sand? You know, God, I look back at my life and I see those occasions when there was only one set of footprints in the sand and, and he's all bummed out and God responds to him, well, you know, those were the times that I carried you. I love this little um, take on it where you see one set of footprints is where I carried you, but that long groove is where I dragged you kicking and screaming. Um, there are times in our lives when you and I just live kicking and screaming against what God wants to do in us. And uh, I think question three is appropriate. What is God calling me to that I've not submitted to? Paul said that he considered everything garbage, rubbish, compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, his Lord. You can't compare it. The cost is great, but the cost is worth it. To know and to be in intimacy with Jesus Christ. To be changed by Him. To be changed in all of those areas that He wants to change us. To be the dad that He wants me to be. To be the husband He wants me to be. To be the follower of Christ. To be the witness that He wants me to be. It's worth it. No one has ever come to Christ and submitted to Him and surrendered to Him and said, You know what? And I mean legitimately, sincerely. And come back and said, wasn't worth it. Jesus did not do what He said He'd do. 
following Jesus Christ is worth every bit of the cost. God, we just thank you and we praise you this morning that you've uh, offered to us this new life in Jesus Christ. I thank you that by your grace we were able to receive it. By your grace, God, you're forming us into the image of Jesus Christ. And I just pray that we've had opportunity to re reflect this morning on the cost of discipleship. And Lord, I know there are areas in my life that I've been kicking and screaming against. I know there are areas that I've not submitted to that you want me to submit to. And God, I pray that we would just be inspired by your Holy Spirit this morning. Renewed desire to be and to uh, submit and to surrender to the work that you want to do. That we would know you. That we would become like you. That we would bring glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen.